Well, good evening, everyone. It's the top of the hour, so welcome. I'm glad everyone was able to make the time to join us this evening. We have a fairly full agenda, and I'm um, looking forward to it. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Obashi Gadek to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. So I am so lucky, and I think we are all so lucky to have Dr. Jen Stein today share some pearls about der dermoscopy. So when I was a resident at NYU um, and she was my attending, I was definitely quite intimidated to have my continuity clinic uh, be chaperoned by an international expert in derm um, der dermoscopy. I remember uh, studying all the buzzwords that you guys will all hear about the networks and the structuralist regions b before the, pre uh, the patient presentation. Uh, but soon after working with D Dr. Stein, I was definitely comforted by how great of a teacher she was. And um, I was definitely inspired by how much passion she had for the particular um, re research and um, teaching that she was doing about der dermoscopy. So Dr. Stein obtained her bachelor's at Yale and her MD PhD from NYU. Uh, she completed her re residency and served as the chief at NYU Dermatology. She also has an international der dermoscopy di diploma for, from the University of Graz in Austria. She's definitely mentored dozens of grateful med students, residents, and faculty, and she's absolutely a leader in or organizational me medicine, which I've also shared some, uh, so, some experiences with her at the AAD. She served on several uh, co committees in professional societies like the AAD, the WDS, the International Dermoscopy Society, the Skin Cancer Foundation, where many of you actually got to hear her um, speak, or some of you, I should say, not many, um, got to hear her speak. Um, she also serves on uh, the International Transplant Skin Cancer Collaborative um, and many others. She is an associate editor for the Journal of Drugs and Dermatology and International Journal of Women's Dermatology. And she's currently the director of the Medical Dermatology Faculty Group Practice at NYU and is a full professor at the D Department of Dermatology at NYU. So I'll just say that there are definitely a few people you come across in your career who inspire you to follow your passion. So thank you for the conversations um, about the differences or lack, lack thereof between um, der dermoscopy and dermatoscopy. Um, and uh, even the priceless words or sayings like furrows are fine and ridges are risky. So with that, I'll let you kind of um, steal the show as you always do. Oh, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. And I'm sure that your whole group knows how lucky they are to have such a wonderful dermatologist and person and leader. Uh, we miss you so much, Toby. You're really, we, I always knew that you were destined for incredibly great things. And I see you are becoming more and more successful and then we'll go on to even better things for our whole specialty. So thank you so much. It's really an honor. Uh, to speak to you today. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, share screen. And I'm going to go to PowerPoint and share and now, good. Okay, can everybody see my screen okay? Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk today about dermoscopy and sort of in the interest of time, I'm going to try to make this as practical as possible. Oh, I should have asked, are people doing, or maybe if you could just give me like a thumbs up or if someone could unmute, are people doing a lot of dermoscopy in your practice or not so much or? Some of us are. Okay, good. So my goal here is I'm going to do some cases and I'm going to do some pearls so that hopefully if you're doing it already, you know, there's still something to take home, but this lecture requires no background information whatsoever in dermoscopy, so you can start. This is okay at square one. Okay, let's see. I'm just trying to, yeah, there we go. Okay, just by way of disclosure, NYU has a relationship with MoleSafe. Um, we get compensated for our telemedicine dermoscopic diagnoses. So you may know these patients. These are the patients who have lots and lots of moles everything looks like it could be a melanoma, right? And we know these people are in fact at higher risk of having a melanoma, which isn't to say that each one of these moles is a ticking time bomb. Remember, it's not as if that each mole is about to become a melanoma, but rather they're just at a higher risk. If they're going to get a melanoma, statistically speaking, it's more likely to be in a brand new spot than one of these funny moles. And lots of these people, these patients, are used to the idea that every time they go to the dermatologist, 
they're going to get a biopsy, right? Or two biopsies. And they're gonna get a phone call that says, you know, it's not a melanoma, but it's a, some people call it a pre-melanoma, which I think is overly alarming. It comes back dysplastic or atypical or Clark's, whatever term you use in your group. And then you call the patient back and say, you have to come in for another excision. And so these patients are just getting dozens of procedures and they're really scared and they're tired of being cut up all the time. So what can we do to take the very best care we can of these patients and most importantly, not miss a melanoma, but at the same time, save their skin so that they don't have to have a biopsy every single time. So I think dermoscopy is very useful. This was my mentor, Al Kopp, who taught me how to do dermoscopy and he's demonstrating it's great because it's quick, it's not invasive, it doesn't hurt. It lets you look at subsurface structures of the skin things you cannot see with the naked eye to tell you you're looking at a melanoma or a basal cell or you're not or something's harmless. Clearly it increases your diagnostic accuracy and reduces unnecessary biopsies. The way to think about it is it's just an additional tool for making the right clinical decision. So the patient tells you my father died of melanoma. I can't sleep at night. I'm so worried about this spot here you know what, it doesn't matter what the dermoscopy shows you, but you want to incorporate it into your overall clinical judgment to help you make the right decision. And it's so useful in those really moly patients. Okay, always adds more information, doesn't replace your clinical judgment. Okay, so here's, I'm just going to start off with an example of how dermoscopy helps you to detect features of melanoma. Here we have this clinical image, it's kind of murky looking, right? It's catching your eye. And here's that same image under dermoscopy. And right away, you see, there's colors here, there's structures. Before we go into any special vocabulary words, there's just a lot more going on. And you're going to know this patient should not leave your office without a biopsy. On the flip side, once again, this is a dark lesion, kind of murky looking, but once we get the scope out, there's nothing to this other than it's just a pigment network. No melanoma features, it's nice and orderly, and we know unless the patient tells you, this looks just like that last melanoma I had that everybody told me was fine and I knew, okay, in that case, doesn't matter that what the dermoscopy looks like, maybe you're still gonna do the biopsy, but otherwise you've saved an unnecessary procedure here. Okay, so let's jump into it. How do we go about making dermoscopic diagnoses? And there's a lot of algorithms out there. There's things that involve, you have to add up numbers and multiply things. But I think in the end, what most people do, what most experts do is really just pattern analysis. Because when we're doing dermatology, we're really thinking about patterns. I think that's how our brains are wired. When you look at an elephant, you don't have an algorithm. You say, okay, does it have a trunk and tusks? And are those three legs or are those four legs? So if I don't know, maybe it's only three legs, then it's not an elephant anymore. No, it's a matter of looking at enough pictures of it so you knew from when you were a little kid, that's an elephant. It's pattern recognition. And the same is true for a melanoma. It's just a matter of looking at enough obvious examples. So some of the examples I'm going to show you are kind of obvious. So you get your eye trained up on the obvious ones so that when you see the more subtle features, you're going to catch them too. And it's easy to get good at recognizing benign lesions because that's what we look at all day long. So I think if you're just starting out with dermoscopy, just start looking at lots of things you know are benign to familiarize your eye with what is normal. Okay, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to do some melanocytic patterns, the benign, the plain old moles compared to the melanomas. And then we're gonna do what I think are my four favorite high yield non-melanocytic patterns, pigmented basal cells, angiomas, sebcares, and dermatofibromas. So there is a basic two-step algorithm. When you have a lesion of concern, step one, you always wanna say, are we in the melanocytic family? So are we in the mole melanoma category? Or is this non-melanocytic, like everything else? Okay, and we're gonna talk about how you make that first decision. And then if you've decided you're a melanocytic, and that reason this branch point is so important is because this is what puts melanoma in your differential. So if you've decided it's melanocytic and melanoma's in your differential, how do you know it's a melanoma versus being able to dismiss this as benign? At the same time, whenever at any point in the branch points you're not sure, always assume the worst case scenario that you're looking at a melanoma because that's what we don't want to miss. That is your safety net. Okay, let's talk about 
what are features that make you think it's melanocytic and put melanoma in the possibilities. So there's three basic things you want to be looking out for. One is, a, and we're going to look at examples of these. One is a pigment network, the second are globules, and the third are structuralist areas. So let's look at some examples. A pigment network, you see it looks, can you see my mouse when I do this? Can you, yes, no? Yes. yes. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so we see here this pigment network kind of looks like a spider web. It never looks totally like a cartoon. This is as good as I could possibly find. Nothing's ever perfectly uniform, but you see it's relatively uniform. And the reason you see a pigment network, or some people call this a reticular pattern, is you'll see this in something that's melanocytic and junctional, right? So imagine under the microscope what we have here in a, say, junctional nevus, or a melanoma with a junctional component, is you have melanocytes or nesomelanocytes lining up here at the DE junction, okay? And this is something three-dimensional that's going on. But imagine your eye is up here looking straight down at the skin and what you observe is two-dimensional. So when your eye looks down this long column of melanocytes, that's gonna look dark. Here at the tip, it's just gonna look light. That's just a few melanocytes. This is gonna look dark, light, dark, light. That alternating dark light pattern is what gives you a network, okay? So if you see this, think melanocytic. We're gonna talk later about whether it's good or bad, but this, if you see network, think we're in the melanocytic category. Second is easy, it's globules, and these are just circular structures. Histologically, these represent nests of melanocytes down here in the dermis, which is easy. Circles look like circles, okay? So think it's melanocytes in the dermis, and when they're little, like this is a dot, and bigger ones are globules, people kind of Category because where do you consider one a dot versus a globule? Don't worry about it. When they're big like this, that's called cobblestoning. This is um, this is a big congenital nevus. Congenital nevi have big nests of melanocytes in the dermis, so we see these big circles here. Totally fine. And finally, we have structuralist areas or any large area that doesn't have network, globules, or some other structure. And this is a blue nevus, but they could be any color. Some people call this blotch or homogenous area. So if you see one of those three things, think we maybe are in melanocytic, and now we're going to talk about patterns. How do you put the structures together in an overall pattern? And we're going to talk about some benign patterns. If you can learn those, you can save some unnecessary biopsies, and then we'll talk about some distinctive malignant features for catching your melanomas. So here we are in that algorithm. We decided it was melanocytic. What's going to reassure us that it's benign? So here are some examples of benign patterns, and they're just ways of putting together network, globules, structuralist areas, into ways that are really symmetric and orderly. Let's go over some examples. So here's that same guy I showed you at the beginning, dark and murky looking, but see all there is to this is just a pigment network. Never looks totally uniform like a cartoon because it's real life, but there's nothing else to this. Totally benign. How about this guy? It's kind of big, has an irregular border to it, but under dermoscopy, it's just patchy network. Okay, no one patch looking different from anything else. Symmetric, orderly, good. This one has a darker edge and a lighter center. Under dermoscopy, it's network around the edge with a light center. You'll notice there are some dots sitting here on the network. That's fine. They're sitting nice and neat on the network, scattered all over the place uniformly, no problem. So this is network around the edge, light center. Commonly, you'll see this in lighter skin patients, as opposed to the next pattern, which is the flip. This is a darker center, lighter edge, okay? And this is just the opposite. It's network around the edge with a darker center. Usually, you'll see this in skin type 3 plus, 4, 5. The darker the skin, the more pigment you're going to see and more likely to have this darker center. This one has kind of a pebbly sort of look. One clue to what's going on here, clinical clue are the terminal hairs. And it tells us probably it's a congenital nevus. As I told you before, congenital nevi are often composed of just big globules. So that's the all globular pattern. And then just to give you another real life example, these fleshy nevi, which we know are intradermal nevi, I just wanted to show you what these look like under dermoscopy. They're made of globules, but they're never like that cartoon example. They're sort of smudgy globules here and there. You know, a lot of these nevi, when, when the patient is a little kid, they're kind of flat and brown. And as they get to be an adult, they get that fleshier 
kind of consistency and lose some of the color. So they lose the pigment. They just have little bits of globules here and there. They often have these long curvy blood vessels like commas. That's all normal. And you see they wobble, right? See how I took one picture smushed to the side like this. I took another picture and I wobbled it off to the other side. That smushy kind of wobbly consistency is good for a plain old intradermal nevus. And these are the types of globules you see in an intradermal nevi. Okay, back to this pattern. One more time, we see something, one color on the outside, a little different color in the center. And this is just network around the edge with globules in the center. So you can put the two together, put the network with the globules, you do it in this nice orderly pattern, no problem. And that, you may have noted this, this pattern of network around the edge with something else in the center. So here was globules in the center, darker center, lighter center. Histologically, they're all the same thing. They're just compound nevi, those double-decker kind of nevi, which are a combo of, of, a, of a junctional nevus here, have a junctional component and an intradermal component, double-decker. And often, compound nevi have a shoulder sign, right? The center is double-decker, and then the shoulder is just junctional. So that explains why you see, remember, junctional gives you a network pattern, and then the center part, in light skin patients where they're just pooped out, not making too much melanin, it'll look light. Darker skin patients, you see more pigment there, it just looks kind of dark. Sometimes you can actually appreciate the globules. So don't be afraid of those fried egg moles, the compound nevi, they're fine. That's your dermoscopy, all good. This guy, we notice, is network in the center and globules around the edge. And this gives us some information, kind of a, a time-wise about what's going on. This is a growing mole. Growing moles are not necessarily bad. New moles have to go come from somewhere. You have this on the back of a 16-year-old girl, no big deal, right? They have, to, they have to start somewhere. And you can impress your patients by saying, oh, I bet this is a new mole. And they say, how did you know it's a new mole? And you can explain it to them. So you should expect this should just grow nice, slow, and steady in all directions, no problem. Okay, here's this blue, dark blue thing. This is just a blue nevus. Blue nevi are just homogeneous blue, so no problem there. So those are your patterns. There's other patterns too, like there's other ways of putting these things together. As long as, and the key here is it should look nice and orderly and uniform, no melanoma features, and should look kind of like everything else on your patient. Now here's some examples of things you can do to mess up those patterns so that they're no longer orderly and they have worrisome features. Let's talk about what those worrisome features are that once you decided something was melanocytic are going to take you into the malignant worried about melanoma pathway. Okay, so things you want to watch out for. We're going to go through them. Streaks, blue-white veil, peppering, angulated lines, and shiny white, shiny perpendicular lines, okay? So streaks are just these lines that are sticking out of the side of the lesion. They represent a radial growth phase. This melanoma is on the move in this direction. Bad news. This is a blue-white veil. This hazy blue-white structuralist area should just be a portion of the lesion as opposed to that blue nevus I showed you where the whole thing was blue. It's just a portion. It's you see it's blue because there's a lot of melanin deep in the dermis with some white, that's the overlying orthokeratosis. Blue-white veil is bad news. Peppering, a lot more subtle. You see over here like sprinkles of pepper, these little black gray dots next to a structuralist area. That represents usually a regressing melanoma. It's subjective. If you think you see it, that's a reason to worry. Any kind of little gray sprinkle always catches my eye. These are angulated lines. Okay, do you see them? The faces are, let me just move the faces over so I can see where I'm pointing to. Okay, good. These angulated lines, and this usually you'll see in extrafacial lentigo malignant, that type of melanoma that happens usually on older people with chronically sun damaged skin. You think it's just a solar lentigo, you go in with your scope, you see the angulated lines, that is a reason to worry, right? You have something like this, and patient looks like they have a lot of solar lentigenes. One of these is darker than everything else. And we see angulated lines. That's not a solar lentigo, extrafacial lentigo malignant. Okay, and you see sometimes they look like rhomboids. You see them over here, over here. That's not a solar lentigo. That's probably one of these early melanomas. 
And finally, we have the shiny white perpendicular lines. Some people call this a crystalline structure because it's like a crystal, it's white and shiny, or a chrysalis, like a cocoon of a butterfly, whatever word you like to help you remember, it's this. You can only see it with polarized light. So you need a scope that has polarized light on it. It represents dermal fibrosis histologically. It is a weird differential of things you will see this in. Most commonly, dermatofibromas and scars. Also, basal cells, spitz nevi, but importantly, melanoma. If you see it in something melanocytic, you gotta worry. Here is on this leg, pink and brown. So this was, I love this saying, I didn't make it up. Pink and brown makes you frown. We have to look at it more closely. Pink and brown makes you frown. And you see these shiny white perpendicular areas, right? There's network here, we know it's melanocytic. Shiny white perpendicular areas, uh-oh, that's a melanoma, 0.3 millimeters. Okay, let's just look at a couple cases, right? So we see this man here, and you see that got a biopsy tray set up over there, so you know this is bad news. And let's just do this for a review. What do we see over here? We see some blue, and we see the white shiny perpendicular lines, and I think I see some angulated lines over here, okay? And that's enough reason, lots of reason to worry about that melanoma. This lesion's got a darker edge over here, and we see network, so we know it's melanocytic, and this much darker side, maybe a few streaks coming out of it, another melanoma. Now, but this large lesion, good network in a lot of places, but see that funny blue, that blue kind of oozing in between the network, reason to worry, and that's a melanoma. One more pink and brown, okay? Hints a network, hints a network, but not uniform everywhere, funny blue, few weird dotted blood vessels over there too, and that is another melanoma, okay? Here's once again, see that woman with a lot of lentigines. One of these things is not like the other. We got this darker lesion over here, and what do we see here? Those angulated lines, and that's extrafacial lentigo maligna, okay? But this lesion, we see network. What do we see over here? Sprinkles, this is peppering, like pepper. Okay, little sprinkles next to a structuralist area. And this, what is this blue square? There's no word for a blue square. If there's no word for what you're seeing, that's a reason to worry. If you can't name it, you have to biopsy it. Okay, all right, streaks, blue-white veil, but anything focal, blue-gray, peppering, angulated lines, white shiny perpendicular, but anything you can't name, if you've never seen it before, can't say for sure it's okay, then you have to worry. Okay, now we're gonna move on to non-melanocytic. Unlike the melanocytic, so remember we got to the melanocytic because we saw this, that, and the other thing. Non-melanocytic is just an umbrella term for everything else. It's your seb cares and your basal cells and your angiomas and everything else, and you get to this category by deciding it was a seb care. So you don't say, okay, this is non-melanocytic, and now what is it? No, it's you're just going now directly to your diagnosis. So we're gonna do these four things that I think are very high yield because they're easy to learn, really um, very easy to recognize features and things you're gonna see all the time. So pigmented basal cell, this is a cartoon that just shows you some of the key features. We have things like maple leaf, brown things like maple leaf-like areas and spoke wheel areas. There's that blue again, blue-gray globules, large ovoid nests, and sometimes ulceration and particular type of blood vessels that look like trees and so my mnemonic for this is things you see in the countryside, or at least this is my version as a city person, things that I think of in the countryside, right? We had leaves and nests and spoke wheels and trees. So if you need a mnemonic, I love mnemonics. Okay, so here pigmented basal cells often have that paint splatter, kind of speckly look. It's clinically, that catches your eye. And here it is bigger. And here on dermoscopy, we see, we see some ulceration. So that's a clinical clue. We see, you see this vessel, okay? It's like somebody drew it with a pen. The point is it's all, the vessel is in the same focal plane. As opposed, remember those vessels I showed you in the intradermal levi, they kind of come in and out of focus. These are sharply in focus. It's all, somebody drew all in the same plane. And there's those blue-gray ovoid nests over there, blue, little blue-gray globules. Once again, that paint splatter kind of look clinically and dermoscopically, each of those little speckles are actually those brown features you see in a pigmented basal cell, things that look like spoke wheels here or like maple leaves. And sometimes you just see the center part. You see they're histologically, they're the same things going on. It's just this 
darker brown with kind of a more orangey concentric circle coming around it. Sometimes you'll see little spokes, but that's, that's really what you want to train your eye to see that dark, dark brown with the more orangey ring coming around it. For really good for pigmented basal cell. Same idea here. And look how pigmented basal cell, you have a person with background lentiginous skin, the basal cell itself has that glassy look, almost like a sticker you stuck on the skin, right? It's the absence of the lentigines you see everywhere else. And of course, we've got maple leaf and the arborizing vessel and little blue-gray dots. And you can get so good at recognizing these, right? You see this little couple little speckles here, and you go in with your scope and you say, oh, yeah, there's the spoke wheels. And white shiny, you see the white shiny also. So that's another clue. Okay, I'm gonna think this is my last guy. Okay, one more pigmented basal cell. And that's just showing you back and forth. This is non-polarized and there's the polarized. And look how those white shiny lines pop non-polarized. See how they pop out with your polarized like pigmented basal cell. Okay, they're usually distinctive. We might say, you know what, maybe you could mistake them for a melanoma because there's blue and they're chaotic. Who cares? No one cares whether you knew it was a pigmented basal cell or a melanoma. Because either way you biopsy, you don't care if you get the gold star from your pathologist for guessing the right answer. What matters is you knew to do the biopsy. Okay, moving on to angiomas. And angiomas are easy because there's one thing to know, the maroon lagoon, okay? And here's your angioma, that's it. This is the only thing you have to know about an angioma. You see these kind of maroon lagoons with these white lines between, these kind of septae in between it easy. That one, you could say, okay, clinically, I knew what that one was. But this one, right, it's a little scalier. You might think maybe it's a basal cell, but you put your scope on it. Oh, that's it. It's just maroon lagoon. You're a little more red, red maroon lagoons. And you get to leave this on. Don't have to biopsy this. Here's a little more purple one, kind of purplish maroon lagoons. Also fine. Sometimes you get these really jet black ones. And Dr. Koff always said, blacker than black, it's not melanin, it's blood. Okay, that black color is often thrombosed blood. This is just a thrombosed angioma. So sometimes these are irritated and patients will want them off anyway, but at least the patient can sleep at night and say it's probably just a thrombosed angioma or an angiokeratoma, commonly thrombosed too. Okay, moving on to sebria keratoses slash solar lentigo. And there's two types of dermoscopic patterns you'll see. So the first are ones that have this sharp demarcation like this, and they have these bright white milia-like cysts, and then these darker comedone-like openings. So that's one pattern. And then this other pattern called a cerebriform pattern because it looks like a brain or it looks like coral, or some people call this gyri and sulci, whatever words you like to use. I'll show you some examples. Okay, so clinically, I know pretty obvious seb care, but I'm using this first just to demonstrate we have this sharp demarcation and see these little craters, the comedone like openings and these bright white like stars in the sky, milia cysts. You can see milia cysts in other things too. You can totally see them in basal cells. You can see them in nevi. So milia cysts are not sufficient to dismiss something as a sebria keratosis. They tend to have really bright ones. So that's just one piece of evidence, but if you're getting any kind of conflicting, worrisome features about it and you see miliasis, the miliasis can't rescue you completely. They should also have you know, some other feature to it. Okay, and here clinically, this might worry you because it has this darker corner, it's not symmetric looking, but you even get a little sense of these little craters here. And when we go, here it is bigger and you're getting sense, you look at the surface of it, those are the culminal openings. Lighter sebria keratoses that you'll often see in people with lighter skin don't have as dark comedone like openings because they just don't have the melanin to it. So they have a little more of that yellowish color, a little more of a yellow orange. In places, this is probably a traumatized sebria keratosis. When they get traumatized, they have a little darker color and you see the comedone openings are a little darker. And then there's your miliasis also. So good sebria keratosis. Okay, and this is the other pattern which goes by a lot of words. Whatever word helps, metaphorically helps you to remember with this. And this is a clinical and here, right? Nothing else looks like this. It looks like, some people think it looks like Carl or cerebriform, gyri, sulci. That's it. Okay, sebria keratosis, beautiful. Now, solar lentigo 
is on the same spectrum with seborrheic keratosis. Because you know how a solar lenticle sometimes evolves into a seborrheic keratosis? So they can have some of the features. I think solar lenticle is a lot harder to see than seborrheic keratosis, but I'm going to show it to you because it's important because we see them all the time. So the two things are, one is this moth-eaten border, and the other is a much more subtle feature called fingerprinting. It's these wavy lines that kind of line up like this, like fingerprints, sort of. Okay, so here's that moth-eaten border, and then if you zoom in, you can sort of see the fingerprinting. It does not photograph well, okay? So if you don't see it, don't worry so much, but, it, but this is kind of the point of it, is these wavy lines that line up fingerprinting. Okay, you can see it better here. Okay, do you see these wavy lines in the background? And so just going over it, you see that nice moth-eaten border of a solar lentigo. This is a solar lentigo on the face, where you'll see some more of these holes punched out in. Those are the adnexal openings on the face. And here's that cerebriform kind of look. And here, this is a nice example of how in the background, it looks like a solar lentigo with the fingerprinting, but in the center, it's evolving into a seborrheic keratosis. And we can see, see those orangey yellow cominal like openings, little craters, and the bright white miliasis. So that's good for the seborrheic keratosis evolving out of a solar lentigo. Okay, so that's a spectrum of things you can see. All right, and finally, we have dermatofibromas. Okay, dermatofibromas, you always really wanna rely on your clinical very heavily. Dermoscopically, they tend to have this white shiny center. The edge can almost look reticular. The reason for that is, if you think under the microscope, what does a dermatofibroma look like? It has this extra pigment here at the reedy ridge. Remember, you see something reticular based on having extra melanin at the reedy ridge. So you see that around the edge. They can have some vessels in them, but most important, should feel like a dermatofibroma, okay? This guy clinically looks real good for a dermatofibroma classic features, that bright white, remember was in the white shiny perpendicular line differential, those bright white perpendicular, and the edge is a little bit brown, a little bit of a faint reticular pattern. Good for a DF, right? See how the edge here looks almost like an evis, but has that bright white center and should feel like a dermatofibroma. But you know what, in the end, whether it was a nevus, a benign nevus, or it was a dermatofibroma, who cares? Either way, you could leave it on and know it's okay. And in patients who don't have much pigment to their skin, it sometimes just looks kind of pink and doesn't look like anything on dermoscopy. Sometimes it just looks kind of white. Um, and then they can have some vessels, they can have some dotted vessels, they can have some serpentine vessels. So don't worry so much about the vessels here. And they can start looking really strange, right? And they have, when they have this reticular edge, if it feels like a dermatofibroma and the patient's got a few other dermatofibromas, you're probably okay. This is not a dermatofibroma. Remember, the white shiny perpendicular lines are in both a dermatofibroma and a melanoma. If it doesn't feel like a, mel a dermatofibroma, the patient doesn't have any others, it's too flat, then worry that it could be a melanoma, which is what this was. Okay, remember, just to finish up, dermoscopy is just one piece of your clinical exam. You always want to put it together with the rest of the clinical picture, listen to the patient, put it together with your history so that in the end you make the right decision for your patient. Whenever you're not sure, if you ever get a mixed message or you don't know what you're looking at, go ahead and still do your biopsy. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was so informative. Um, I know I just learned a couple of things and I'm thinking back to some patients I just saw earlier today, actually. Um, I'll pass it over on to Rich and Heather. I'm not sure how we want to do the question segment. Yeah, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand in, uh, you know, in the system and uh, Heather will bring you up and, and uh, unmute you so you can ask your question. So Heather, let us know if there's any questions in the queue. Do you know if any, um, if we all know how to raise our hands? Um, so to, to raise your hand, it should be on the bottom of your, if you bring the mouse near the bottom of your screen, it should bring up a little bar there to, to raise your hand. And we, we do have one um, here, uh, Dr. Muse, you're, you're unmuted. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. Yeah, uh, when I see, um, 
that the uh, in a pigmented lesion that the uh, pigment sp spares like the fingerprint ridges. Uh, oh, and acral? Huh? You mean acral? Like on hands acral and or, or a, it doesn't have to, you know, or, or just ridges of the skin. It kind of. Oh, it, okay. I see. Okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. You know yes. what I'm saying? I, I yeah. always uh, uh, think of that as a benign thing. And I. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like in solar, a solar lens to go off. Yeah. Does, that's one of the features you'll see. Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 tell the, of, I, tell, yeah. I tell the patient that if it was malignant, the pigment would want to go everywhere. It wouldn't yeah. affect any. I think that's a pretty safe assumption. Um, you know, unless it's giving you some other worrisome kind of thing. But that's so common, it's true in a solar lentigo, is that it'll spare the skin lines, yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay, uh, we also have Linda. Linda Gibbons, you're unmuted. Hi, thank you. Are there any characteristics uh, specific to spitz nevi? Yes. Okay, let's see if I can pull it up. This is a part of a larger talk where I have things hidden. And for sake of time, let's see if I have Spitz Nevi in here that I can pull up. Let's see if I can get to my Spitz Nevi section. Oh yeah, well, hold on, I just passed it. Okay, I'll do this real quick because I don't want to take up too much of your time. Okay, where did I think I just saw my Spitz Nevi. So I'll just start talking in case I don't get to it in case it's not in this talk. So Spitz Nevi, there we are. This is a Spitz Nevis. Okay, let's see if I can do, I'm trying to remember how these are organized. Okay, good, good, okay, let me do. Okay, so there's three typical patterns you'll see in a Spitz Nevis. One, this is the most classic one, easy to learn, but this is in the pigmented spindle cell version, you know, the AKA like spindle cell Nevis of Reed. Uh, is that it has a starburst pattern. So it has these streaks, but they're totally symmetric around the whole edge. Sometimes there's no color at all, and all you have are regular dotted vessels. And then sometimes there actually just has these globules, and it could have those white shiny lines. Because remember, white shiny perpendicular lines, one of the things in the differential was Spitz Nevis. So those are the three, and this is another one, the white shiny perpendicular lines. So these are the classic things you see in a Spitz. Just like I said for everything else, it has to make sense with your clinical. So you have an 80-year-old with a Spitz Nevis. Even if it looks classic like this, you're probably still going to want to biopsy it. Let me see if I have a slide that talks about Spitzoid melanomas. Because you can have, yeah, there we go, right? Spitzoid melanomas that can have, kind of looks like a starburst here. And like, yes, it has the dotted vessels. So a little, like a three-year-old, okay, it's a Spitz Nevis. An 80-year-old, it's probably not a Spitz Nevis. 25 year old, probably okay. You're still going to probably want to biopsy it. Thank you. Okay, next uh, we have Dr. Rosenbaum. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here's a quick question. So, of the last 100 lesions that you looked at with your dermatoscope, how many times did this, which is under the scope, change what you would have done clinically? Oh. Well, I would say, okay, so I look at a lot of things with dermoscopy. So I, I, I use, that's why I like to do non-contact. And um, so let's think about it in both directions. So how many things do I not buy? So I'm looking at, say, a patient has 100 moles. Like maybe I look at 20, 30 things on that patient, and I wind up not biopsying any of them. So I think that changed my management in that direction. And then I would say a lot of times I see some, like, little subtle pink thing, and I look at it, and I'm like, oh, there's a basal cell. So I would say out of the last hundred things I've looked at, I, you know, I would say, okay, let's just say how many times a day, I would say probably about five times a day, there's something that I find that I otherwise with my eye wouldn't have, like something drew my attention to it, and then something I saw under the scope said, no, you got to biopsy that. Okay, I have to say, my, I mean, in my experience, you know, I, I, I have a nice dermatoscope, I look yeah. at all the lesions, but almost never would I have changed anything? I, it's, it's fun to see the, the, the nice patterns yeah. and whatnot, but uh, clinically, I, it almost never changes what I would do. So uh, maybe I just 
I'm not that good at it. Or maybe my eye is super good. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that's for medical true. legal reasons, I do it. Such a good clinical eye. I think there are people who have a very, very good clinical eye. But I think sometimes you're sort of seeing some of the same kinds of features, like using a sub care or whatnot, you know, and then you've sort of developed other techniques also. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next we have Dr. Sands. You might have to unmute your phone, Dr. Sands. Am I heard now? Yes. Ah, sorry. Thank you very much. Thanks for the lecture, Dr. Stein. I have a question for you. When you're looking at quality measures for providers, what do you think the value of looking at the benign to malignant ratio of pathology is? And do you think there are downfalls that should prevent it from being used as a quality measure? So controversial. First of all, until we have you know, natural language processing ability to pull stuff out of a biopsy report. I think it's real. So we've discussed this and Toby knows because she sat on these meetings about whether it should be part of a quality measure or not. So theoretically, yeah, it would be great to have a quality measure to say, you know, this provider is able to biopsy only what needs to be biopsied and they're not wasting patients, money, you know, morbidity, biopsying, other things. But first of all, it's hard, it's not easy to measure a benign to malignant ratio. Like we've done it for research purposes, but it's sort of time intensive. So I think um, hopefully as technology advances and you can pull information out of biopsy reports easier, I think that's the first thing that will limit it. And then of course you risk going in the opposite direction, which is, um, is leaving things on, right? Because you always want to be taking out, you never want that to be one, right? It's like you don't want to leave, when you're taking out append, people you're worried that have appendicitis, you need to be taking out a certain number of normal appendices to know that you're not missing an actual appendicitis. So it's, so it's a really good question, very controversial, um, and I think we still have to figure out the best way to put that into practice. Okay, that's, that's all the hands I have raised. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Stein. Really appreciate your time and your talk. That was awesome. And, and you are correct. We're very lucky that uh, Dr. Obachi Gadak is on our team. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us this evening. All right. Take care. Be well, everybody. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.